Um, where, where does new Calvinism fit in with evangelical more broadly? Right. Um, it's a definitely a minority segment of American evangelicalism. It, for, for people who pay attention to the movement, it may seem like the, the biggest thing or, you know, the whole thing, but it's not. Um, there is a broader evangelical landscape that includes what I call mainstream evangelicals and other, other groups too. So like um, there's neo-Anabaptist evangelicals who hang around the Missio Alliance and read David Fitch, for example, or Greg Boyd. Um, and there's progressive evangelicals, people, you know, like Rachel Held Evans or um, Rob Bell, that type of crowd who resemble mainline liberal Protestants in some ways, but kind of um, are in the, or were, um, Rachel has passed, but in the evangelical orbit. Um, so there's, um, if I had to guess, and it's only a guess, I would say that the new Calvinism constitutes maybe only five, maybe 15, five to 15% hmm. of American evangelicalism. Um, it's largely an, a college educated movement. Um, and most American evangelicals are college educated, for example. So you have to look at middle America, the broad landscape. Um, there's over a thousand evangelical mega churches in the United States. So there's a lot going on. The evangelical world is a lot bigger than a lot of people see or notice. So um, it's definitely a minority um, of American evangelicalism. You mentioned in the book that, you know, kind of this emerging church, you talked about earlier in this, in this conversation, the emerging church movement kind of came out at the same time. And then it seems to me like the neo-Anabaptist movement also kind of got big about the same time. What, what was going on in the evangelical world that sort of created, that caused some of these, maybe some of these different little tribes or groups to start crystallizing or developing around the same time? Right. So the short answer is in the mid to late 90s, attention to postmodernist philosophy and how Christians should respond to it. So post the, um, the emerging church conversation really took off in the mid to late 90s especially 1997, 1998, um, about how evangelical Protestants should respond to postmodernism as a thought framework and postmodernity as a socio-cultural condition. And so from the late 90s through 2000, you know, five, six, seven, it was the biggest thing on the American evangelical landscape, as far as I could tell, was how should we think about postmodern philosophy and the postmodern condition? They would define those things, you know. And um, there were different answers to those questions. Um, um, Mark Driscoll and Marcel Church were a part of that conversation for a while, and, and, and they were pretty much uninterested in revising theology and ethics, but they were more open to revising, you know, how things are done in church and that type of thing. And so that's, you know, one answer to the to the emerging church conversation. Others um, were eager to revise theology and ethics and became what I call the emergent or, or progressive stream of American evangelicalism. So that would include people like, like I mentioned, Rob Bell, Brian McLaren, Tony Jones, Doug Paget, um, Rachel Held Evans, and several others. Um, Another thing that would come out of the emerging church conversation was kind of this neat new monastic tendency trend in American evangelicalism. Um, you can think of someone like Shane Claiborne living in holistic communities, intentional communities across the country. And that's one expression of a bigger neo Anabaptist kind of pocket of American evangelicalism who kind of take their cues from the Mennonites and other peace churches but with a strong evangelical bent to them. So um, in the book, I say that the emerging church conversation from the late 90s through about 2005 served as a sifter of sorts to um, create and fortify what are currently the major expressions or pockets of American evangelicalism. So kind of everybody kind of squeezed through the emerging church conversation and came out on the other side either as a progressive emergent or kind of a neo-Anabaptist 
with maybe some intentional community um, angles, or uh, you ended up, you know, a Calvinist, and some, and, and then there's still uh, this huge infrastructural backdrop of mainstream evangelicalism that you can't ignore. You mentioned when you went to undergrad, you said some interest in the emerging church movement. And I'm wondering what motivated you to pick the new Calvinist movement versus some of those, you know, new, maybe the neo-Anabaptist or the emerging church movement to do your dissertation. Right. Um, so I knew somebody was already working on a book about the new monastic movement with the Shane Claiborne types. And that was published as a book with Oxford University Press in 2015. It's a great book that actually uses a similar theoretical framework as mine does um, by Wes Markovsky. He's a, he got his PhD in sociology as well. So I knew I didn't want to write a book on the new monastic movement that was taken. Um, the, there are already people writing books on the progressive um, side of American evangelicalism, and as that was linked to the emerging church conversation. Gerardo Marty has a book, The Deconstructed Church, also published by Oxford, which is a great treatment of that. But nobody was really writing a scholarly treatment of this Calvinist phenomenon. And it had been something I'd been paying attention to um, on the internet for a few years, and it struck me as something that I could tackle really well. So that's when I, that's when I took up. This 2006 to 2008 period where you say the new Calvinism really became a thing is really also when essentially, uh, you know, Internet 2.0 became a thing, right? I mean, I think the, the iPhone came out about that time, and, and this is really when sort of the, the rise of social media really started to take off. What is the role of the Internet in the rise of new Calvinism? Yeah, I think the new Calvinism is at least as much an online religious movement as it is a flesh and blood religious movement. Um, you have people, you know, following Mars Hill's sermons every week or um, in that period as well, I think it was 2007 that the gospel coalition launched and they have a very, they have a, you know, behemoth of a website. So um, the internet and other sorts of digital media provide young evangelicals kind of the, you know, the portal to this whole world, this whole religious world, where they can watch sermons, listen to podcasts, read articles on the Gospel Coalition or Nine Marks or Desiring God. They all have their websites. And, you know, it's, it's, it's huge, especially for people under 40. It's um, it's an outsized reality, to, to borrow a phrase from the book. The Internet is an outsized reality for younger people, not just Christians. So it's, um, I don't think the new Calvinism really would have coalesced as a thing if it wasn't for the internet, among other things. Well, it's certainly great for distribution. I mean, I never would have heard, I would have been a, stuck in a tape ministry, I guess, other than listening. I mean, I personally, I'll bet I personally listened to probably a hundred um, Mark Driscoll sermons back in the 2012-2013 uh, time frame. And I was watching a lot of these sermons online. I watched a lot of John Piper sermons. And so the internet lets you essentially go to church, if you will, any, you know, anywhere in the country you want now, because you can just download, download their stuff. That's right. You can have an eye on all sorts of mega churches and pastors, and you can even get a sense of like what it would might feel like to be at their services. Even, you know, you can't really get it fully, but you can get a sense of what it might feel like um, and, and how they, how they preach. Um, definitely. The, the internet it is and was huge. Um, for the movement. Unfortunately, I was only able to dedicate, you know, I don't know, three or four pages in the book to it, but I, I tried to strike that note strongly and say it would have been impossible without the internet. 